2 Corinthians 1. The thing that uh, I love Christmas, I love the Christmas season, but I find that um, it can become distracting. That's, that's bad, but it can become distracting. There's so much that uh, is happening, so much that we want to do, but yet we're so kind of caught up in the craziness. Um, so uh, Lynn and I did a great thing this week. I think all of our Christmas shopping's over. And I still got enough to buy lunch today, so that's a good thing. But um, I, I kind of wanted to get the, the other stuff out of the way. And I, I don't encourage you, I'm going to try my best to take some time in the morning every day to have a little time of worship to kind of fine-tune. How many of y'all remember AM? Some people only know FM. But how many of y'all remember AM? Y'all remember we used to have to kind of, FM, it just came in, bam, you got it? But y'all remember uh, no static? Well, sometimes you had to get it in to get all the static out of the way. My, my goal this season is to every day kind of fine-tune it and have a little worship static-free. And my Lord wants that, and I want it too, but I'm so used to hearing the noise of the world. So uh, I think this, this Christmas time, let's, uh, let's make a promise that we'll just say, Lord, I don't know how much time. I mean, you don't have to. If you've got an hour of worship, amen, hallelujah, praise God, my schedule allows me to do that. But not everybody has that much time to where you can. So um, take five minutes um, with a cup of coffee in the morning because life begins with coffee, amen. It does in my house, at least for me. So um, I'm grateful for the Christmas season, but if it, it comes upon us quickly, and, it, and by the way, it's going to be gone in a hurry, and, and we're going to breeze through this thing, and let's not miss, we say it all the time, don't, you know, Jesus is the reason for the season, but we've got we've to be willing to allow that to happen in our hearts and lives. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 1, Paul is writing that very intimate, personal letter to the church at Corinth. By the way, the church, he was the church planner. He was the one who took the gospel there, and God blessed it, and God created uh, a great church, one of the greatest churches in that Greek culture, that setting there in Macedonia. So, though they were, they came out of unbelievable, unbelievable paganism to follow the one true God. But, but yet, they weren't there yet, kind of like me. They, they weren't quite there yet. They were still having to work on it, struggle with it every day. So I thought it was unique that this church, who was founded by Paul, they still griped about Paul. They would look for any excuse to kind of run him down a little bit and say things that were not so great about him. And a matter of fact, in, in this second letter to the church at Corinth, he was almost having to defend himself. I mean, they would not have had the gospel of, of Christ if he had not been willing to go and share the gospel with them. But yet they found fault in that. And that's kind of where we see this particular passage uh, open up and begin. So if you would, would you stand with me in honor of reading God's Word, 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. And let's begin in verse 12. For our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity. That's a goal for all of us. Not with fleshly wisdom. Now that's what we're born with. But by the grace of God and more born abundantly towards you. For we are not writing any other thing to you than what you read or understand. Now I trust you will understand even to the end as also you have understood us in part. That we are your boast as you also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now hear this. And in this confidence I intend to come to you before. That you might have a second benefit. He said I was coming to you. I, I, I shared with you that I was coming. But basically some things got in the way. To pass by way of you to Macedonia, to come again for Macedonia to, to you and be helped by you, 
on my way to Judea. Therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly? Or the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh? Am I doing it in what I think, what I, in my feelings and in my emotions? Was, I, was this a flippant thing that I said I would come? He said that with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no. If we're walking through life just basically going by our feelings and emotions, if it's easy, we'll say yes. If it's not easy, we'll say no. If we like it, we'll say yes. Chocolate cake. Amen. If it's coconut, we'll say no. Right? Amen. Well, bless you. God created it. Somebody's got to like it. Verse 18. But as God is faithful, is he faithful? Amen? But as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, by Silvanius and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him, in Christ, was yes, boldly, following the truth, doing that which is right. I'm going to follow through. For all the promises of God in him are yes. That would have been a good time for an amen. Let me try it again. For all the promises of God in Christ are yes. And in him, amen. amen. To the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God who also has sealed us and given us the spirit in, my heart, in our hearts as a guarantee. He begins by bringing it down to this, that all we have in Christ, with Christ with us, is yes. It is the amen. It is true, so be it. We have this. God has promised it. May we hold on to it and live it. In Jesus' name, let's pray. Father, more of you. I thank you that I received everything that I needed on the day that I found the end of myself and found the beginning of you when I believed in you and I trusted in you and I gave my heart and my life to you and I invited you not just to be the yes, yes of that which feels good, but to be the yes in all things. Your truth, your life, your promises, your blessing in all things is always for good, always for good, always for our benefit. And Lord, we rise up and we give you the glory in all things. So Lord, speak to us personally as we not only say the first yes, but Lord, bless us as we say the second yes. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. A few weeks ago, I began this by looking at Christ when he took the cup. And when he looked at the cup, he knew that the grapes would have to be crushed. He knew that he would have to be crushed for the benefit to come. He didn't want that. We talked about when he went to the Garden of Gethsemane and he prayed, if there's any way this cup can pass from me, nevertheless. And in that nevertheless is where we have to live. It's not just with the feelings and the emotions and the feel good. We can't go through life just looking for the feel good. We've got to somehow come in here and say, whatever is good and right and best, amen, in my life. So Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. Thy will be done. The answer to that was yes. And I'm grateful for it because I'm the beneficiary of him, be, him being crushed on my benefit. I could not know him if the blood was not squeezed out of him by which I am cleansed and which I live and am sus sustained. Then we talked the next week about Abraham. And Abraham who had come to know God. Yet he knew that it's one thing to know, but it's another thing to 
Know in a way that you're experientially, experientially going to act upon it. So when God said to him, I need another yes from you. Yes is that you believe in me. That's good. But do you trust me to live it out? And the second yes was when God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac. Take him to the land of Moriah. Take him up on that mountain. Offer him as a burnt offering unto me. Abraham had to say, well, Lord, I believe in you. Lord, I trust in you. But he had to say, Lord, I trust in you in such a way that the answer to that is yes. I call that the second yes. The second yes. And he had to walk it out. No shortcuts to the second yes. In the circumstances of life, when it doesn't necessarily always feel good, when it's not just cotton candy, you need something of substance. In this room, if we poll how much you trust in Jesus and how much you believe in Jesus and how much you're willing to lean not unto your own understanding but in all ways acknowledge Him and let Him direct your path, the answer on Sunday morning is most definitely yes, yes. But then when we face the difficulties and the struggles of life, then we come and say, well, I don't know. I, I, I know I believe, but, 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 but. Remember we said we got to keep our butts out of it? We have to quit saying but to God, but just yes and trust Him. And He gets honor and glory from that. Then last week I reminded us that the angels were created in the very presence of God. They didn't have to worry about sin. They had everything of all of God's nature there provided for them. But yet, it wasn't enough. One third of the angels wanted something different than God's best. They wanted themselves to be equal with God. They wanted to lift up themselves and their pride. And we understand that that was the beginning of their fall. A fall that will separate them throughout all of eternity from a holy God who created them for much more. But then when he created man, even before he created man, our God had a plan and a way. And it was done, it was performed for us. It was decided that Christ would be the offering before the foundations of the world. The plan, the opportunity would be there. And Christ was faithful to that, amen? All the way from heaven to Bethlehem to live a humble life, putting us first. And yet, though he was denied and rejected, he was faithful to the cross, through the tomb, and outside for new life, resurrected life, new life in him. And because of that, if we so choose, as, the ch as one third of the angels chose badly, we have the opportunity to choose well and all the blessings. And though we, we may start in a world of sin with a sinful nature, we can end eternally with the blessings of being with God forevermore. Amen? And I'm grateful that the gospel story can find us where we are and make of us into what we need to be. We would, we would mess it up. But God just gives to us that which is the gift of, it's the gift of Christmas, it's the gift of life, and it's the gift that keeps giving. Oh, what a Savior. But Paul understands that we're still here in this world. And for too many, they're trusting in just the first yes. I made a decision for me personally 47 years ago. And I put my sins, my life in his hands. And by the way, 
He wrote my name in the Lamb's book of life. When the roll is called up yonder, amen. I'll be there, and I hope you will be too. Praise God. But he left me here so that my life could be a living sacrifice unto him. So that my life could bring glory and honor to him. Now listen, I got saved not by my goodness, but by his glory, his grace. And after he put that within me, I now live not by my wisdom, not by my feelings, not by my wants, but I live also by that same grace of God. And I give that same grace of God. As I was forgiven, I will forgive others. As I chose God at the beginning, I choose Him every day. And that's the opportunity we get. So he says to this church, listen, it's not the flippant choices of life that, well, I, I, I think I'll do this today. Well, no, I don't want to. Or He says there are some things that we need to hold on to. There's some things that, that we are blessed by. He says in verse 18, but as God is faithful, our word to you is not with just the, the things of the emotions of our thoughts. We need more than that. Let me see if I can describe this. I need something in my life so that when the circumstances and the difficulties and the hardship comes, I don't have to sit back and say, okay, now, do I need to, I don't know, if, let me, let me, uh, am I going to do this or not? Am I going to believe or not? Am I going to trust him? Oh, but it's so hard. Listen, it's not like that. We need something more than that. I need to make the decision now before the crisis comes. I need to pray now before the difficult decision comes. As a matter of fact, let, let's just make it very plainly and it's true. I need to say yes now before I even know what the question is. Rick Parts and I were talking this week. We, I believe it was last Sunday night, as a matter of fact. He was talking about when I was preaching on Abraham and Abraham took Isaac. He said, Abraham didn't go to Sarah and say, is this okay with you? What would Sarah's answer have been? You're not taking my boy up that mountain. <laughs> Mamas, that would have been a good time for y'all to say amen too, <laughs> right? You see, it wasn't for Sarah to decide that. It was what God told Abraham, and Abraham had made up his mind before the question came. So when God spoke, he just said, yes. I call this the second yes. I call this the second yes. When I trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior and Lord, I said yes. And I became part of what was called the bride of Christ. Amen. He's the groom. And I'm the bride. Have y'all seen all these wedding, uh, or not, I guess you, you, you'd say when they ask someone to marry them? Some people do it on a billboard at a ball game. After 30 years of preaching, I don't advise that. <laughs> Amen? Some do it in very public places, you know. And some do it quite awkwardly. But if she really means that much, you're going to offer it. Have y'all seen these things that this guy gets down on his knees and he's got the band playing all around him, you know, and he got the choir, all that kind of stuff going on. And he bows on his knees and he puts the ring out there and she goes, oh, like she didn't know what was coming. <laughs> Amen. She knew what was coming. And she says, yes. And she puts out the finger. And he puts the ring on the finger. And she's thinking, my life just got so grand. <laughs> they got a TV show now called Say, Say Yes to the Dress. Y'all know that one? 
I mean, they, they've got the, the engagement ring on, and they've got to pick out the dress, and they have to try on 45 of them before they find the right one. And then when they finally get to it, see, I actually have seen this show because I have a daughter that's not married yet. So I have watched this show. I think I turned my mic off there so Jody didn't hear that when she sees this. But they, they finally come back and say, are you saying yes to the dress? And they say, oh, yes, yes. Well, listen, folks, what they need is me to come in there. <laughs> Amen? And I'll say, before you say yes to the dress, are you willing to say yes to the mess? <laughs> come on now. <laughs> Amen? Because what, they need somebody like me to say, hey, are you willing to say yes, though? I promise you he's going to leave his socks all over the house. And he's not going to pick up after himself, and he's not going to wash the dishes. And if something goes wrong, you're going to be the first one to blame. Are you ready to say yes to that? Don't you think I'd do good? <laughs> because you see, they see that groom is the, 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 the white knight up on the, the white stallion to come in and to rescue them and take them off. Listen. When I accepted Jesus Christ, that's who I was looking for. I was looking for my Savior and my Lord and my Master and my King to come in and take me out of that ugliness of sin and just make me His own, and I am the bride. But then He said, those who are rich need to become poor. Uh, hold on, I'm signing up for what? Those who are given much, much give, must give it away. You must allow me to be your all in all. Now, you need to make up your mind. Is Christ enough? Those angels in glory who were in the presence of glory, and they wanted their own. Most of the time when people come to me for marriage counseling, I had someone this past week ask me if I did marriage counseling. I said, yes. Sometimes I bring my wife with me to do marriage counseling. They need to hear both sides of it. Usually I come in and I take my box of Kleenexes and I sit it down. And I say, how can I help you? And then they start telling me about all the junk. John Maxwell, a long, long time ago, said marriage is a four-letter word. W-O-R-K. But I heard a better maxim. Love is a choice. And you choose to love up, down, left, right, good, bad, hard, easy, when you're on the mountaintops together, sing praises to God together. When you're in the valley together, hold hands and get on your knees and praise God together. On the good days, bless his name. On the bad days, do the same. You see, if not, you're, you're going to make up your mind every day whether you're going to be in love or not. And they come in there and they say, well, I just don't love her anymore. Well, you jerk. <laughs> Choose to love her today. What would it be like if God only loved me when I was lovable? <laughs> Amen? Are you grateful for the forgiveness and the love and the mercy of God? I want to be the bride that puts a smile on his face. I want to be the, the bride that when he says to me, do you love me, do you trust me, we're going to go down a path that's going to be very difficult, but I want you to love me in that difficult path. Are you willing to say yes? Are you willing to, here, I promise you this, if you go to the doctor and the doctor says cancer, that's not over. That's an opportunity to let the glory of God shine. 
If you're going through the difficulties of finances, if you're going through the difficulties and the struggle with children and grandchildren, that's not a time to yell and quit and stop. That's a time to draw closer and draw near and say yes to God. Yes, Lord. Even when you don't understand, say yes. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Don't look in this for the parts that you like, and you'll say, that's the part I'll be obedient to. All of it is good. All of it is for your benefit. Trust Him in all things. I am going to make this a Christmas message. Mark is wonderful. He heard me talking to Laura about my what I was going to preach on today, so he sang Emmanuel. And I noticed that what the choir sang, a door brought in Emmanuel. What does the word Emmanuel mean? God with? That's right. God with you. It was promised, Isaiah 7, 14. Amen? Hebrews 13, 5 says he, he will never leave you, never forsake you. The Great Commission, when he takes us and, and says, this is your job. This is what you're supposed to be doing for the remainder of your life. Go, be on mission with me. But he says, lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age, end of the world. I'm there. Emmanuel. So I got a partner. Not just my groom in heaven one day, but he says, I'll be with you today. Now, I hadn't seen him yet. But I have seen his spirit. Look in verse 20. For all the promises of God in him, that is Christ, are yes. All the promises in him are amen, which means it is true, so be it. To the glory of God. Listen, are you looking down? Look at God's word. You can see it on the screen. It says, to the glory of God. Through us, in us, these promises are being made true through us. The glory of God is seen by how we abide with Christ, live with Christ, and Christ manifests His glory, the very nature of heaven, which we will have forever and ever and ever down here, in our circumstances, in the darkest and the hardest and the most difficult of times, God's Spirit, God's promises will show up and He'll make those things alive in us. Verse 21, for He who establishes us with you in Christ, the word established there means to make firm, to make sure. It means to confirm. He who has confirmed it. He who has made it absolutely sure and permanent is Christ. And he has anointed us in, is God. Rick, come here. If you're going to sit on the front row, you, your Jim Warren's going to be part of my example. It's like God came down and said, I love you so much. I bless you so much. My promises that are sure, I have put my hand upon you. I put my blessing upon you. I will speak the word over you. You are covered by my grace. Anointed. That's exactly what the word anointed means. Now, you didn't get much blessing out of that. But if Christ were here, you'd be overflowing. Amen? He loves us that much. By the way, that's a promise. Are y'all good with a promise? A God promise? Verse 22, who also has sealed us. The word means in order to mark a person. You know back then, you know this, you've heard this illustration. That, that they would wear the ring that would have the seal on it. And they would come in and they would mark you as one belonging to them. I have been sealed, I have been marked by God, I belong to Him. So who, it, do I belong to me? No, I belong to Him. So who's going to provide for me and take care of me? Whose promises are going to be covering me? Whose provision, whose power is going to be there over me? Whose power will protect you? Whose power that to heal and to bless 
and to magnify and to multiply. Whose promises? The power of heaven. The power who can hold the stars in place. The power who can take galaxies. We talked about that last Sunday night. So big and so magnificent. And God holds them in his hand. Who also holds the very atoms, the very cells, the most minute with the protons and the electrons and the neutrons. So small you can't see them. But that doesn't mean that they're there. And God's power controls it all. If God can control that, God can bless you. Who has sealed us and has given us the spirit in our heart as a guarantee. Old King James uses the word earnest. You go to buy a house. My wife does real estate. I heard her talking on the phone the other day, and she's like, well, you're earnest money. And I'm like, amen. She's getting biblical on me. It means to have a promise and to be sealed with a promise. If you're going to go buy a house, y'all just bought one. Amen. Y'all had to give that money up. Bam. And you don't lose it as long as you go through. Right? It's a down payment. What did he give to mark us? The spirit of the living God within us. As an earnest, as a token, that holds us and keeps us until the day I see him face to face. The Spirit of God that lives within me comes with me 24-7. Emmanuel, God with you. Church, let's just bring this home. What problem do you have that's bigger than God? What difficulty are you facing that God doesn't know? There's, there's, life's hard. And in this room, it sounds real easy, but folks, I'm telling you, God's got it. For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. But the thing I need to remind everybody else, God says, for I know the plans I have for you. There's a lot of things I didn't choose, but he chose for me. And he promised that they're good. And he promised, he sent the very Spirit of God that when in creation, when God said, when Jesus said, let there be, the Spirit of God took those words and by the power of God made them alive. That same Spirit lives within us. So who can separate you from the love of God? Can all those things, all those difficulties? No. I ask you, take a little time every day, begin your day and worship. I just kind of want you to put this mental picture in your eye, in your mind. It's you and Christ. You and Jesus. So if God puts you in a circumstance, I, I've said it a couple times about the doctor's office. Let me just... If you go to the doctor's office, you're taking Jesus with you. And no matter what that doctor says, Jesus has already given you the amen. My, my, my daughter called me crying. Scared me to death. She couldn't talk. She was giving me the, calm down. Because I thought something was wrong. I thought somebody had wrecked. Something, something bad was happening. Well, it was something bad, but it wasn't, my, it wasn't her. But her best friend found out she's 26. 28, found out she had breast cancer. They had taken it and found out it's a stage two something. And I told Jody, I was like, it's all right. She tried to think I was being flippant about it. I'm like, no. I, I promise you, God saw it already. And I, I, I understand Hannah. I love Hannah. I love Hannah. But God loves her more. And I just promise you, whatever it is, it's okay. This is a blessing. She's going to walk through this, and she's going to find a new side of God that she's never seen. She's going to walk through and find Jehovah Rapha. And she may have heard about Jehovah Rapha, but she's going to experience Jehovah Rapha now. So I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what God's allowed. I will tell you that he'll prune you. 
I will tell you that the power of God comes. God doesn't use anyone mightily until he breaks you mightily. I just promise you. And you may say that sounds backward. That's okay. God knows what he's doing. Diamonds are formed under pressure. He wants no rival. He's a jealous God. He wants his best for you. He promised it. You just need to receive it. I want this mental image. When you said yes, you weren't thinking about the mess. But I can tell you after 30-something years, 31, almost 32 years of marriage, it's better now than it's ever been. I know her now. I was figuring her out. Lord, menopause <laughs> will make men pause. <laughs> She's my pride and joy. I love that woman. And it doesn't matter. I choose her. That's me. I choose her. I choose Christ. So you're going to walk through difficult times and hard times, but I promise you, the Lord's going to bless. Me and the Lord, he's going to say, boy, I chose you. I'm going to say, yes, sir, I choose you today. I chose you then, but I, today, Lord, the answer is yes. That's what he says. Are you willing to say yes no matter what? How many of y'all trust your pastor? Are y'all lying? You're willing to say yes as long as it makes sense. You know, what the, the right answer to that would be, well, I trust Christ, but I'm not too sure about you. <laughs> That's good enough for me. Trust him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. And always acknowledge him. He'll direct your path. Say yes. If you've not ever said yes the first time, you're not his. You don't have that token. You don't have that bond that says that you're one. You don't have the spirit living within you. You don't have the forgiveness of God. You need to choose yes. You need to choose Christ. You need to give him your life so that he'll give you his. But for many of you, you've said yes. But you need to make up your mind today and say, no, Lord, no matter what, the answer is yes. In the good times, praise his name. In the bad time, do the same. Let's give him glory today. Let's give him glory. <coughs> Thy will be done, Lord, on earth, just as it is in heaven. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, this is your church. These are your people. Father, you know every heart in this place. And Lord, you love us in an amazing way. I just want to say if there's anyone in this building that does not know you, Lord, as Savior, as Master and King, I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would speak to that heart and call it to you. Give the invitation. Lord Jesus, you did more than just kneel down. You went to the cross for us. You rose again to give new life. I pray, Lord, that if there's anyone in this building, anyone watching, Lord, that they would find the wisdom to say no to their sin but yes to you and give their heart and life to you. Lord, I pray that you not only save them, but Lord, give them a holy boldness to tell others about you. They would never be embarrassed about the God who did so much for them. But Lord, also for those that are already Christians today but need to say the second yes, 
Father, be with them. Give them the courage and the boldness to invite you into that circumstance as well. Father, may they make up their mind today that the answer in Christ is yes. Father, may this invitation show where we are in our walk with you and our willingness to follow you wherever you would have us to go. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.